in space, things can go balls up in minutes, seconds even. For when this happens and the worst case scenario is realised, there is always the option to abandon ship. Hi, Rick here, examining what happens when things go wrong and the role of escape pods and the like within a Starfleet vessel. Escape pods themselves come in a variety of shapes and sizes, and while the technology involved is much the same, the outward design of them changes to reflect the vessel that they're built for. This is because the ships need to be near the surface of the hull, and also unobtrusive in design so as not to create unneeded protrusions and the like. Some share a design, as those on the Intrepid class and the Defiant, which were manufactured at around the same time, so it makes sense that they'd fit a universal pod design. Other times, however, a vessel's design necessitates the construction of a uniquely shaped escape pod to maximise use of space. After all, these capsules need to accommodate the entire crew of a starship and guests, so an economical use of space is a must. The emergency escape pods, or lifeboats, are stowed across many ships, just below the hull and aimed outwards and away from the vessel, whereas ships like the Intrepid class stored their escape pods beneath the outer hull hatches, the Sovereign class needed their own completely new design that slotted directly into the recesses in the hull. This would have both benefits and negatives. A hatch protects the vessel and the more fragile pods from debris and the like, but equally could become damaged and not deploy correctly. The hatchless variant was prominent in ship design moving forwards from the 2370s. The various designs thereby had different interiors, but each seated 6 to 8 people. The Intrepid had 36 pods located across several decks, so its total evacuation capacity was 216 to 288 depending on seating. This also does not include Voyager's infinite number of magic shuttlecraft. I'm joking, but in all honesty, a quickly prepped shuttle might also serve as a useful escape vehicle. The only downside is that shuttles need prep time, so this wasn't always an option. The Defiant class had 26 of the same model of lifeboat, so it could have evacuated its entire crew, plus quite a bit extra. I've already done a video on the alert conditions which are sounded when a starship is about to encounter danger and what they actually do to the makeup of the vessel at ready status, so if you want the thematically linked video, that ties in nicely. Presuming whatever danger the vessel has encountered is deemed terminal to the ship, the captain or whoever is in command at the time can give the order to abandon ship. It's very important to note that only the current commander of a vessel can execute that order so as to avoid any confusion. When an evacuation alarm was issued, an automated PA system would make sure that everyone on board knew of it. Part of life aboard a starship, civilian or otherwise, was the involvement in drills, one of which would have been evacuation actions. Every person on the ship was assigned to a pod to which they had to report to in case of evacuation. This strict designation was to prevent people scrambling over one another trying to reach the nearest pod and allow for a more orderly evacuation while practice ensured speed. Once seated within the capsule and its capacity reached, the pod was jettisoned away from the vessel with a powerful and sudden acceleration lessened by the inertial dampeners. This was to accelerate the diminutive craft away from a potential blast radius of an exploding starship and hopefully lessen the chance of any debris impact. Once adrift, the pods are pretty much waiting to be rescued. The escape pods are without a warp core, so there is no warp drive at all. At most, they have mild impulse engines, but more often than not, they simply have control thrusters that allow for some basic manoeuvring, stabilisation and course correction. What they do have, however, is a very powerful subspace transmitter that can cut through a lot of interference and has a rather large range. This beacon is of course to capture the attention of friendly rescue vessels, however it can be silenced on command in case of nearby hostiles. Depending on the make of the lifeboat, there are now several different options. In most cases, the pods simply drift awaiting rescue. Those installed on the Intrepid and Defiant classes had enough provisions and power to last its occupants for eight months. Older models like the ASRV had only room for one occupant, but had a gaggle mode function where they would seek out the other pods and link up, 
creating a pressurised seal to share space and resources, these ones had enough power to keep a single occupant alive for 86 days. However, the docking of more of these vessels increased survivability drastically. Aside from drifting in space, the vessels had decent scanners and would be able to locate and guide pods towards any landmarks, such as a planetary body, ideally an M or L class world. The H class escape pods had a heat shield across their outer surface that was as strong as the hull of the vessel from which it came. This made for a powerful barrier, and although all makes of pods were suitable for atmospheric re entry, the H-Class was even more so adapted. Generally, the pods had enough thrust to escape gravity wells before they became an issue, but once down, could not produce enough to take off again. Making safe landfall drastically increased survivability too, and was usually recommended. Unless you died on impact. Or your pod was damaged. Or the planet was a gas giant. Ugh. That would suck. Imagine sinking to crush depth in a gas giant. Like beans in a can being run over by a bus. Or beans with those little sausagey things in them. I'm hungry. Speaking of, the pods. They had ration packs, but I suspect from the whole eight month supply thing that they had emergency replicators installed. I couldn't find much to confirm that however, so that's just a educated guess. But it would save on a lot of space and if the power died, then you could turn over to ration packs. Feeding six for eight months is going to take up quite a lot of room otherwise, and escape pods were all about maximum survivability in minimal space. Speaking of space, there was very little room in them, especially when fully occupied. There were recycling facilities aboard, which meant that, well, everything would be recycled and broken down to be reconstituted, including waste. I suspect there would be at least a closet to house the latrine if it were needed to capture and break down all waste. I hope that's not where the food comes from. On top of this, most escape pods had a single phaser strip. I highly doubt that it was very powerful and after all, using it would cut into power reserves, but perhaps it could be useful at times. So, time spent in such an escape pod simply drifting would be rather taxing, no doubt. At only just over 3 meters cubed, there was very little room to exercise, and after too long, any rescued personnel would be in dire condition but hopefully alive. On the bright side, chances are good that if you were jettisoned in Federation space, there is a high chance you will be rescued, and even battlefields are surveyed after the fact to look for survivors. If your beacon is inactive for some reason, then there's also the chance that your life signs could be detected, and there's always that pod's phaser array. Pew pew, I'm over here. Ideally though, making planet fall would be best, where you can then reunite with other dropped pods, and then set about implementing your Starfleet survival training. As dire as the situation is, think about this. The amount of times that people have been rescued from shuttles that have crashed and those things aren't even designed to keep you alive for months at a time. So yeah, escape pods for the win. The exact contents of a lifeboat are not disclosed in Prime Canon, but as real life equivalents contain things like flares, fishing lines and basic survival gear, it's likely that the Star Trek equivalents contain similar but futuristic variations. Maybe not a fishing line although it would make sense to have some form of hunting gear if the pod were to make landfall. Adding to this, we get a thorough look at the inside of a Star Trek Kelvin Universe survival pod, and although these were limited to one occupant, each did have a survival kit inside it. That kit contained tougher attire to protect against the elements, communication gear, a hand phaser, and medical supplies. Although from a different universe, those sort of basics make a lot of sense and are likely included in most Prime counterpart models. Again though, cannot confirm. Starfleet guidelines in survival situations require crew to seek each other out and make every attempt at being rescued. Most Starfleet subspace transmitters were detachable from their ship, such as those in runabouts, so maybe the pod would even contain something like this where you could remove the transmitter and relocate it should the need arise to leave the point of landfall. 
I like saying landfall, you may have noticed. So there we go, the general actions during and after an escape attempt from a doomed Starfleet vessel. I was surprised how little information there was on this sort of thing. I could find a lot on the specs and designs of the escape pods, but most of that was basic canon and Trek Yards did a useful video focused on that element a while back, linked below, but as for the actual survivability and what comes after the launch, that's kinda lacking would make for a cool episode however. Anyway, thank you for watching this video on the Starfleet style escape pods, and I hope it was entertaining. Maybe I did this because I'm sympathetic to the idea of staring at the same four walls in a small room for months at a time, but at least here I can crack open a window. Wouldn't recommend that in space. Thanks again for watching, I've been Rick, goodbye.